Interpreting is said to be one of the oldest jobs in the world. Ever since humans traveled to different continents to meet new people, there has always been the need for translating between languages. But in spite of that long history of interpreting, there are still so many things that we don't know about how we interpreters interpret. This is partly because recording was not easily available up until the end of last century. The primary question that we interpreters always ask ourselves is quite simple What's interpreting? So today, I would like to explore this question together with you through linguistic experiments. So, experiment number one. Now, I would like you to translate in your head the following two English words into Japanese. And if you don't speak Japanese, you can think about it in your own mother tongue. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. Fake race. What did you think? Maybe these two English words are stuck in your head and you're trying to transcode each of these two English words into Japanese. But maybe that didn't get you anywhere. Maybe that didn't solve the problem, right? And if that is the case, I can give you a hint. When words don't make sense, then we have to get out of the world of language. Or in other words, we need to de verbalize. I said de verbalizing, and this is what I'm interested in sharing with you today. De verbalization was originally proposed back in the 1970s by a conference interpreter, Danica Seleskovic. She was criticized a lot during the 80s and 90s due to this controversial theory she proposed, but the concept itself has survived to this day. And here I'm not interested in arguing whether this concept is academically valid or not. Rather, I'm interested in applying it because this concept holds a key to understanding how we interpret, how we can learn a language better, and how we can communicate better. Anyway, getting back to this experiment, I ask you to not think about words, but then what did you start to do instead? I think you started to imagine what fake race is like. Maybe some of you may have thought about some,、uh, some Japanese s u m o bout that is fake. Some of you may have thought about some other sports match that is fake. But whatever it is, if you did this kind of imagination through de verbalization, then by now you should know the answer. Yes, fake race is yaocho in Japanese. So this is how de verbalization works. Step one. Stop thinking about words. Step two, imagine. Step three, get an image or a picture. And step four, explain that image in your language. So, this is what we human interpreters are doing as well. And if you did this process of de verbalization, then I'm happy to welcome you to the world of interpreting. I said human interpreters. But on the other hand, what about machine translators? Do they de verbalize just like we do? Unfortunately, they don't de verbalize because they can't imagine things. So for them, the words like fake and race are all they can think about. They stay in the world of language. But for us, we humans can get out of the world of language. We can, we can think, we can imagine, and we can de verbalize. And that is the difference between us humans and machine translations. To demonstrate that difference, I actually put this yaocho into machine translation to see what the English translation would be like. What do you think they gave me? This is what I've got 800,000. <laughs> so it's surprising because words became a number, fake race became 800,000, right? But if I take a close look at it, this yaocho's yao part literally means 800. Okay, but then this cho literally means long. So I don't understand why it's translated as thousand, but at least it is clear that machine translations stay in the world of language. So the lesson for us here could be this when we compare words and meaning, sometimes meaning is beyond words, they are far away from each other. 
So what we have to do is to get out of the world of language and get into the world of meaning. I said the world of meaning. Then what is happening in this world of meaning? That's the next question. To compare, in the world of language, I'm speaking in English. It's spoken by 1.5 billion people. It's called a global language. But on the other hand, in the world of meaning, we need to speak another language. But actually, this language is already spoken by 7.7 .7 billion people, which is the entire population of this planet. We call this language imagination. Well, some people have poor imagination, but at least they have an ability to imagine something to a certain extent. So, when English is global, imagination is universal. And I can hear you say, why are you talking about this, Ryohei? What's the point of talking about this, right? It's because this is what I've been always thinking about when I translate in the translation booth like this, between Japanese and English. So ever since the Tower of Babel, people speak different languages. When we don't share a language, then what can we share instead, I wonder? And I think one of the answers is imagination, because it's universal. Anyone can imagine. And that's actually the meaning of communication, because the word communicate is originally a Latin word that means something is shared. So I think I've talked enough, right? Now it's your turn. Now let's experiment how deverbalization works. I will give you two more experiments for you to deverbalize, okay? So experiment number two. Please think about this question by deverbalizing. What's the origin of the English word bank? Well, this is a little hard question because this word has so many meanings in Japanese and it's so confusing. But today, let's try to deverbalize and try to understand this word a little deeper. So for you to imagine and deverbalize, I will show you two different pictures about bank. This is the first picture about financial institution called bank. And what do you see here? We see that money is piled up, right? And this is the second picture about river bank. And what do you see here? We see that the rocks are piled up, right? And then what is in common between these two pictures? It's the fact that something is piled up. And that is the answer to the question. That is the origin of the English word bank. How did we get to this conclusion? We did this by deverbalizing, right? We didn't think about words. We saw two pictures. We imagined, we got an image, and we explained that image in our language. So this is how deverbalization works. So the lesson for us language learners could be this. Sometimes we can learn a language better and deeper when we don't use it or deverbalize. That's experiment number two. And experiment number three, I want to tell my wife something through the following three questions. So please think about what that something is by deverbalizing. Okay? Here we go. Um, how can I forget all these days and memories I have shared and spent with you from the first day I met you? Do you imagine how much you mean to me, and do you see how helpless I am without you? So these are the questions, but I'm not expecting her to say yes or no, right? Rather, these questions are the triggers for her to Deverbalize and imagine something. And what is that something? It's, I love you. So these are the questions for her to deverbalize and imagine how much I love her, right? So the point I'm trying to make is this. Sometimes the most important thing that we want to tell, that we want to communicate, is not verbalized. They are deverbalized, right? And that's actually the spirit of Japanese poetry, or haiku, some of the greatest haikus do not verbalize everything. They minimize verbalization, but at the same time, they maximize imagination through deverbalization. 
So derivalization is a part of Japanese spirit. It's part of us. So now I've been standing in front of you, but I'm not an inventor like Einstein. I'm just an interpreter in general. And to be honest with you, there is nothing new in what I'm talking about today. After all, the concept of derivalization was already proposed back in the 1970s, which is decades ago. But I'm still standing here because time and time again, people forget the most fundamental communication, uh, most fundamental function of human communication, which is that we communicate the meaning, not just words. So I wish that this talk were about a new invention of a perfect machine translation, but it's not. Rather, my talk is a reminder of something that everybody knows so well, but everybody forgets so well, time and time again. So if we can derivalize better, maybe we can understand each other better. Maybe we can learn a language better. Maybe we can communicate better. Maybe we can live better. Maybe we can make this world just a little bit more comfortable place to live in for each of us. And that's what we human interpreters are trying to do every single day by traveling between the world of language and the world of meaning, where imagination and deverbalization are the shared and universal languages. So I come back to the original question. What's interpreting? By now, you should know the answer, right? If we can imagine, we can deverbalize. And if we can deverbalize, we can interpret. So in essence, this means that we're all interpreting in our daily lives. We are all living in the world of interpreting. So if you think interpreters are living in a different world, then you're wrong. This talk is an invitation to the world of interpreting, and this talk is an invitation to another possibility of communication. So, welcome to the world of interpreting. We are all interpreters. My name is Ryohei Onishi. Thank you.